Hi, listener. Here at Let's Talk Bitcoin, we're building a global network of correspondents able to contribute on the ground perspective when cryptocurrency related information comes across their filters. If you'd like to join our global conversation, send an email with your name and geographic or cultural niche to apply at letstalkbitcoin.com. Just like Bitcoin, the only barrier to entry is your time and good work. Thanks for listening. Our keynote speaker today is a liberal in the classical tradition. He considers himself to be from the Austrian School of Economics and a leader in exposing Wall Street corruption. He has triple degrees from Dartmouth, Cambridge University, and Stanford University. As CEO of Overstock.com, he took the company from $1 million in revenue to over $1.3 billion in revenue. He is a true pioneer, and he made history in the Bitcoin world when Overstock became the first major online retailer to accept Bitcoin. So ladies and gentlemen, I would like to take this opportunity right now to introduce our keynote speaker, Mr. Patrick Byrne. Thank you, John. Thank you, John, for that overly generous introduction. Members of the Bitcoin Foundation board, ladies and gentlemen, cryptographers, computer scientists, uh, finance geeks, quants, Austrian ec economics theorists. Uh, I think there's a, maybe a couple gangsters in the room, journalists who are trying to make sense of it all. It is a surreal honor to be invited to speak with you today, uh, both because of who you are and because this is taking place in Holland, in Amsterdam, in the Netherlands, I should say. Uh, and I would be remiss if I did not take a moment to acknowledge a debt that historians generally overlook in my country, the United States, and in other Commonwealth, or in Commonwealth countries, uh, a debt owed to Holland, to the, I'm sorry, to the Netherlands. To, uh, and that is the creation myth, so to speak, in the, in the United States is that we had these founding fathers, the Constitution was written, Declaration of Independence. Those who know something know that though our founding fathers read a lot of an English philosopher named John Locke, who was a social contract theorist, wrote a book called uh, Two Treatises on Government. Uh, and maybe we know that there were these people, the pilgrims, who came to our country with some notions of religious toleration and such. So we see the intellectual history of our country as coming from these two sources. What is generally overlooked in this story is the enormous contribution our hosts the Dutch, uh, made to that process. And it's a, it's, a, it's a story that's generally overlooked, but I'll be touching on it later. Uh, so first, I want to thank uh, uh, them uh, for hosting this. And I'll tell you just for a moment, I'll spend a moment about uh, who I am. You may have, a few months ago, Wired did a, a large story uh, about me that they and I'll just point out, they called me in this the Bitcoin Messiah. Just to be clear, I'm not the Messiah of anything. And as much as I favor Bitcoin, or I love Bitcoin, it's, I'm really a, uh, I'm about the crypto revolution. I'm about the cryptocurrency and other missions for this technology. Uh, I'll also mention that or point out, I was called the scourge of Wall Street. I could spend hours telling you how this came about, but I just want to tell you one, I'm going to give you one amuse-bouche uh, of, uh, out of a decade-long story. And that is, but just to give you an idea of who you're listening to, uh, and maybe you don't want to listen, in January 2007, a, a very well-known and actually a well-regarded hedge fund manager in New York, uh, kind of an elder statesman of the industry and not himself a bad guy, and a fellow I had known at a distance for some years, asked me to come see him. And I went to sit with him, and there was a witness there, and this has all been actually vetted by this journalist. This is all true. The, uh, this very well-known hedge fund guy sat me down, big guy, and his opening words were, Patrick, uh, you need to know you are the most hated man I've ever known in my entire life. 
You used to be kind of a golden boy here on Wall Street, but now you could kill people and you wouldn't be hated like we hate you in this town. So, of course, to me, and I assume to you, that, that's high praise. I mean, <laughs> they can carve on my tombstone that in January 2007, I was the most hated man on Wall Street. And how I got that way actually ties in rather a deep way to what brings me here today. Uh, I should apologize now if any of you, if this talk isn't what you were expecting. If you're expecting a guy to get up and talk about blockchains and stuff, I'm not the guy. Uh, I want to talk about the historical context in which I see the Bitcoin revolution and the cryptocurrency revolution. Alas for you, I can't really do that without talking a lot about history. So if you didn't expect to come to a lecture this morning that included a lot on history and philosophy, I hope you can get your money back, but that's, that's what I've brought. Uh, I'm going to start with discussion of two books that invite us to view civilizations as operating systems. One, probably known to many people here, uh, is Snow Crash. Now, Snow Crash is kind of a cyberpunk Bible. It, was, it, came out in the very, it came out about 92, 91. And for one thing, it's known for being really quite visionary about the direction the internet would develop uh, with what they call the metaverse, but what we came to know as the World Wide Web, even Facebook, uh, the idea of distributed republic. This is kind of the Bible for anarcho-capitalists, if there are any of those here. Uh, memes, actually the concept of a meme actually comes out of this book and many other things. But the real value of this book, it is invites us to view civilization as operating system. You know, nobody gets all excited. There's, there's Unix and DOS and Windows and Mac and Linux and nobody gets, nobody kills each other about which is the right operating system. It's all just, there are other virtues than truth when you're talking about an operating system. Well, he invites us to view history the same way, that this is really that Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, East Asian Confucianism, these are operating systems, and history is an enormous Petri dish where these different organisms are in a Darwinian struggle to, to figure out what the, what the best operating system is. And taking that a step further, a book that came out a, just a, a couple years later by Francis Fukuyama, Trust. Now, Fukuyama wrote a fa another famous book called The End of History. He's kind of the last Hegelian of the 20th century. Uh, but his point of trust is, his point in this is that you can view different cultures and civilizations as operating systems to solve one central problem. And that problem is... How far does trust extend in a society? If you're in a low trust society, family-based society, China, Taiwan, Italy, you don't, his argument is that you don't trust people outside the family, which means that you don't get businesses bigger than something that a family, maybe a large family can run. And that means that you're limited, you give up economies of scale, was his argument, as opposed to high trust institution-based societies where you can trust outside of your family, you can trust institutions, you can trust things like the government, you can trust shareholder corporations and, and all this plumbing and mechanism that underlies the modern world. And because you have that trust in a high trust society, you get efficiencies of scale, you get et cetera, et cetera. That's his argument. I'll be circling back to that. Uh, so now, history. George Orwell said that you could imagine the future as a boot stepping on a human face over and over forever. I don't think that's true, and I don't think that's going to be true because of folks like you, but thinking of, of that as an operating system, that was, in fact, the, the family of operating systems throughout all of history till about 500 years ago were more or less some variation of that operating system. Uh, then something really odd happened 500 years ago here in Spain. And of course, the Europeans among you do not need to be reminded. Once, 500 years ago, Europe was an, a sea of Spain with an island of France in it. But this was Spain. And in these northern provinces, 
well, this was part of the Spanish territory, as was England, uh, or the co-monarchs, Ferdinand II. Whenever I see Game of Thrones and I see Joffrey, I think of Ferdinand II. This strange idea started developing in the north, and it was a collection of ideas, uh, uh, generally philosophers called liberalism. The, the basic common DNA of them all was that uh, the consent of the governed mattered and started off in two places in the Spanish Empire. One was here in the Netherlands, uh, where ideas like tolerance, pluralism, constitutional uh, federation of free states and peace emerged. And it's hard to imagine, like, like some scientists prove somehow that fish don't know that they swim in water. I don't know how you prove that, but they don't know that they swim in water. We live in the modern world, and it's hard to remember what the world looked like before these ideas came along. But this was not at all intuitive to people. Uh, Erasmus, the great Catholic theologian, the University of, at Rotterdam is named after, uh, he introduced these concepts like religious toleration, political toleration, and pacifism. Baruch Spinoza, the great one, from right here. And if, you're, if you have time here, you should visit the National Museum and learn a bit about them. But Spinoza came up with the idea of the self, the modern idea of the self, as an agent to whom consent, from whom consent mattered and who was capable of consent that mattered in a political system. Maybe these ideas emerged here of tolerance and pluralism and constitutionally protected freedom emerged here perhaps because of the middle class, the merchants. should mention that also a, a generally historians consider a large factor is the expulsion of Jewish people from Spain and Portugal. And they came here, this, the best ones, well, Portuguese ones came here. In fact, in the synagogue here in town, which I also suggest you visit, uh, they spoke Portuguese into the 20th century because it had such an influence. Uh, if you were a Marxist, you might also say windmills. The invention of windmills here uh, gave this society a great deal of cheap, abundant energy, gave it a huge advantage, competitive advantage over everybody else. And everything else I just mentioned is this ideological superstructure that came with this economic development, technological development. Uh, but these ideas emerged here, and interestingly, a group of separatists, that would be English Protestants who didn't believe they could reconcile with the Church of England, they came here. They came here at the beginning of the 1600s, and they lived here for about two decades in Leiden. They finally got fed up. They actually loved it here, and they learned, they, in, they, were, they learned these values. They learned that a society modeled on, this kind of, on these kind of principles could work. They were discouraged, though, quite literally, by the effect on their young that was had by Amsterdam. The licentious and wicked ways of Amsterdam was corrupting their young. And so they picked up and they sailed to North America, where we know them as the pilgrims. But they actually, and we give all this credit, we think of England as the, as the cradle of liberty, but in fact, it was all conceived here. Also, John Locke, whom I mentioned, who had such an effect on our founding fathers, he came here, sitting out some of the English Civil War, spent three years here, went back and wrote this famous book, to treat as a government that became sort of the founding inspiration for the U.S. Revolution and, uh, and much that came after, at least in the British Commonwealth. So these, that's why I say these ideas owe such a profound debt to this country, uh, the cause of freedom, U.S. Constitution. That's one side. The other thing that was going on in Spain about 400 years ago, very interesting, at the University of Salamanca, a group of scholastic Jesuit and Dominican friars came up with, they were, became the first economists. And they introduced, they discovered notions that were kind of lost and not rediscovered for 300 years. But things like the subjectivist theory of value, which we now equate with Marshall and the Cambridge School of Economics, 1880s, that was actually first developed by Jesuit 
and by the scholastics in Salamanca, impossibility of socialist calculation, which uh, is, it was again, a main theme of the second half of 20th century economics. Uh, quantity theory of money, the equivalence of cash deposits and demand deposits. In other words, why fractional reserve banking isn't a good idea. Uh, the value of entrepreneurship, value of property and contract, uh, and again, a piece, an anti-imperial platform that was quite critical of the, the days of Spanish imperialism from within Spain. Well, something funny happened to this, to this school. They bounced, these thoughts bounced through Spain, Italy, to the eastern edge of the Spanish Empire at the time, the eastern edge, the eastern reign, the Österreich, i.e. Austria, and they went into hibernation for about 250 years. And about 150 years ago, they came out of hibernation in the form of the Austrian School of Economics. And those who I met here last night and this morning who think of themselves, they say, as Austrian school guys, it actually all started, didn't start on Austria, it started here, well, it started in, in Salamanca. And I consider these two school, I consider these, this generally the heart of liberalism, of liberal political philosophy, of, of uh, pro, pro freedom, I like to, I like to call this, this way of thinking. Now, I, people always object, well, sometimes people object to me, maybe not in this crowd. You can't hijack the word freedom. You can't say you're pro-freedom, other people aren't. Well, there are people among us who call, in our society, who call themselves progressives. And if they hijack the word progress, I think I can hijack the word freedom. This to be understood in opposition to the great philosophical mistake. And this all circles back in one more slide, I promise. It circles right back into Bitcoin and what you're doing. But I need to describe this great philosophical mistake, basically a virus that was introduced into the operating system of liberalism. It was introduced, and it, it's authoritarianism, and it's key, if the key element of the DNA of liberalism is consent to the governed, for authoritarianism, it's submission. Uh, the great enemy of mankind, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, introduced it. His book, his version of the social contract, written really in answer to Locke, makes this very extraordinary claim that, you know, so finally the, basically the, the authority, the control freaks knew that they had lost. The enlightenment come and they had lost their grip on history. So they subverted it with this idea that, okay, it is consent that matters. It is the consent of the governed, but not in this silly way that John Locke understood it. We, intellectual French, understand it in a much deeper way. I, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, understand that there is something that he terms la volonté générale, the general will of the people. And that is important. That is what matters. But it's not to be determined by silly voting or something that, in fact, there may only be one person among us in a nation who understands what the real will of our people is, what the real will uh, of the nation is. And that, that person is the sovereign has no need to give no, give no guarantee to its subjects, no constraints. There need be no constraints on it. His will is or should be nothing but the law. This Robespierre, uh, when he forces everyone to obey his will, it looks, it just looks like tyranny, said Rousseau, but it isn't tyranny because he's forcing people to be free. And true freedom is found in submission to this force that understands the general will, that understands the real historical mission of our nation, of a nation. And that's true freedom. Well, this was, uh, Voltaire read this and wrote a famous response to Rousseau where he said, uh, I have received, sir, your new book against the human race and thank you for it. One longs in reading your book to walk on all fours. <laughs> I love Voltaire. Bertrand Russell was once asked, did he have a Bible? And he said, yes, I keep it over there under my Voltaire. <laughs> 
So Voltaire was correct, but unfortunately he didn't win the day. This became a really dominant strain in our in modern political philosophy, starting with Rousseau, led to Kant, who, you know, Kant was a pietist working away in Kronigsberg, famously never left the city. In his bare pietist study, he had one adornment, a, 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 a portrait of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And in his Teutonic way, he worked out the implica- implications of this theory in this, well, grand and, and Teutonic way, develops the idea of ein Volk, ein Volk, a, a, the mission of a, of a people. And that freedom, I'll, freedom is found in subordination to this mission, that that's true freedom, not, not the freedom that the phenomenal self looks in, which is just what you or I want to do, the pursuit of happiness, life, lo- life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness is how Locke put it, that that's just this sort of superficial form of freedom, that true freedom is understanding the historical process you're part of, and through submission to that, Hegel comes along, I never got anything out of Hegel other than late stage Kant uh, and some Prussian stuff, uh, Marx, who takes Hegel and says famously, I'm going to take Hegel and turn him over and stand him on his feet, meaning he's going to take all the dialectic of Hegel, but apply it to economics. And this is the real historical process that matters. That mankind has a story. It has chapters and the final chapters, the ultimate triumph of the proletariat and such. And freedom, again, is, is defined as submission to that process or commitment to that process. So it's a very different definition of freedom that had been that had emerged in Holland, uh, England, Scotland, uh, and then the Americas. Nietzsche, who reads like he's an individualist, cares about the individual. He doesn't care about the individual. He's all about the Zarathustra, the individual in a capital I kind of way. Uh, and Nietzsche famously dismissed dismissed this whole other tradition, saying. Only an Englishman cares about happiness. That's, that's his answer to John Stuart Mill and Jeremy Bentham and the utilitarians and John Locke, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. He says, only an Englishman cares about happiness. In other words, I, Nietzsche, I understand the real historical uh, mission and where, and where freedom is to be located, again, in some sort of submission to that. Lenin... Of course, for him, it's not the masses, it's the, the vanguard of the masses, the party, freedom. And I used to live in communist China, and I used to debate these kinds of things with intellectuals there who would actually maintain these points of view that what you think of is, as, is just bourgeois Western freedom. Real freedom is submission to, in our case, the communist party. Of course, the Third Reich over the gates at Dachau and Auschwitz, the signs read, Arbeit macht frei. Work will make you free. Work for the German state. Work for the Reich. Again, this idea of submission, properly chosen submission, is where real freedom is found. Mao, again, I lived in China in the early 80s under Deng Xiaoping and used to have these conversations. And I was in Cambodia in the late 80s and speaking with French educated intellectuals. And it's amazing that in these kind of places, everybody knows the Rousseau. Everybody knows Rousseau, Kant, Hegel, the Marxist canon, of course, but the three Western philosophers, they always knew in these, in these places, in, were, or especially Rousseau. So that is, as Voltaire said, mankind walking about on all fours. This idea that this is how you define freedom. The, uh, uh, so the great, the great, Corruption occurred from Jean-Jacques Rousseau. So going back to this issue of trust, where does that leave us? Well, the one vision, the vision that I think is fundamentally authoritarian, believes that we need central institutions. And it argues for centralized institutions. In one form or another, it's uncomfortable with institutions that are not centralized. It all comes out of that authoritarian tradition. The problem, and it's funny, this fellow himself who wrote this is considered a conservative, Fukuyama, but his, uh, you know, he's arguing that you want high trust society. You want to live in a high trust society where you can, where you can have robust centralized institutions, taking for granted, of course, that we can trust those institutions. What's neglected in his analysis is the whole problem of regulatory capture. 
And regulatory capture is an extraordinary field in itself. It was invented in 1972, a guy named Stigler, friend of Milton Friedman's. And he just noticed that, look, society sets up regulators to protect us from certain industries and certain forces. But sometimes those regulators have a tendency to get captured, to get owned by the industries it's supposed to be defending us from. There's a Marxist at Harvard named John Hansen who argues an even deeper theory he calls deep capture, which is that it isn't just the regulators get captured by the bad guys, it's regulators and congressmen and police and journalists and judges and academics that the capture goes very deep. Uh, I started a website eight years ago called Deep Capture that explores well, it's won various awards as the best site on corruption in the United States, best economic investigative journalism in the United States, stuff like this, where I explore the capture and corruption of our centralized institutions. The great problem comes down to, if I'm right, and that there is more capture occurring than is sort of generally recognized, what happens is what John Kenneth Galbraith called the bezel. He spoke of the bezel. And the bezel is, in a modern society, there's, if you could sort of freeze time and ask every single person, what's their stake in the financial system? What do you own? And you could add it all up, you get this much, but you look and there's only this much there. And the difference, and at any given time, there is this difference. And he calls that difference the bezel, which is the, the amount that has been embezzled from society, and none of you know it. And at any given time, there's the bezel that is growing at a fast rate or a slow rate. I, uh, I became convinced about 10 years ago there was an enormous bezel in the financial system. Uh, and the two centralized institutions that I think are the sources of it. And I think 2008, a lot of different causes for 2008, but one of the causes is it was a manifest, some of this bezel bubbling to the surface. And the two centralized institutions that are to blame, uh, central banking and central counterparty clearing. And both of these, central bank, uh, the reason I'm so committed to Bitcoin and crypto is because crypto can solve the problem that both of these organizations are presenting to society. In the case of central banking, it, it, it follows once you have fractional reserve banking, and fractional reserve banking started, was legalized in 1844, Robert Peel in, in the UK. By the way, there's a wonderful Spanish economist who writes about the Austrian school and central banking that people here maybe like. His name is Jesus Huerta de Soto, and he's written on the subject. But anyway, the, the, once you have fractional reserve banking, you're always going to have the elites who own the banks over leveraging themselves. And they over leverage themselves in one way or another. They go kaput. They need a bailout. They need a lender of last resort. Once you have a lender of last resort, you have somebody who thinks you have a, a central bank and they think they can start directing and guiding and fine tuning the economy, the tinkerers. There's a fellow at London School of Economics who refer, who says their vision is the economy is an enormous engine and they're like a workman with a screwdriver and they think they can just fine tune it and get it just right. And that's their, that's their vision. The problem is the problem with this way of viewing the world is we laugh at the Soviet Union, those of us old enough to remember it, for trying to run a country with, without prices, without real prices. They had 23 million prices being set by apparatchiks in a bureau in Moscow called Gazplan or Gazprom or something, that uh, Gazplan that they set 23 million prices, the, how much the screws cost that would go in this bracket, that would hold, go in this bookshelf, 23 million prices for everything in society being set by apparatchiks. And we say, oh, how ridiculous. What a crazy way to try to run a country. But in our society, the most important price we face 
is the price at which we discount the future against the present, which is to say interest rates. And interest rates are being set both in Europe and the United States in central institutions called central banks with names like the Federal Reserve of the United States. That's, it's, you know, we laugh at the Soviets for it, but we're doing it with the most important and fundamental price in our society. Central counterparty clearing. This sounds so dull, but it is, I think, an enormous opportunity for you cryptos here, for Bitcoin or some Bitcoin-like technology to emerge. This is what I'm talking about. There's a... Uh, when you watch a movie, you're not conscious of the grips and the gaffers and the lighting guys and such. You watch the movie. When you trade in the stock market, it's the same thing. You don't, you don't, you just assume underneath it all, there's some plumbing that makes everything work. So when you buy 100 shares of IBM, it's getting your account, so forth. Well, starting about, we went public in 02, our company. And when you're a public company CEO, you're out there in the mix. We're mix I'm out there with hedge fund guys, prime brokers, banks, all these kind of people. And I, by 04, well, I quickly became aware there was a bunch of criminality going on. Didn't take a lot of genius. I was asked to take part in it. By 04, I had it pretty well mapped out. I know just who was doing it, the network of hedge funds. There was a network of about 15 hedge funds in America centered on a guy named Stephen Cohen that were at the center of a huge stock manipulation scheme, which included insider trading. I started talking about it publicly and naming them by name, as I just did, and I promise no one will ever sue me because none of these guys can take discovery. And incidentally, Cohen later, this whole network came under investigation, became the target of the largest federal investigation of Wall Street in history. 80-odd people have been sent to jail. Cohen himself just paid a billion eight fine. And it's the tip of the iceberg. I think the criminality goes far deeper than anything you yet imagine, even in this audience, uh, on Wall Street. But the real th thing that was going on that, that I got arguably a bit obsessed with is the whole question of clearing. Clearing and settlement. You, you assume that there are those that plumbing underlying the financial system, making everything work. And let me promise you, so I got into this very deeply. It's way too arcane to go into here unless I get the right questions. But <clears throat> there's far more slop in the systems that underlie the transfer of property and title in our society than you would possibly think exists unless you were part of it. There's far, let me repeat that, the, the systems by which property rights and title get transferred have gotten lots and lots, oh, I thought I was going to yank off, uh, s s of slop. There's some academic reasons for it that they thought it was okay. There's more fault that basically property rights have gotten secure, digitized and securitized and hypothecated and rehypothecated and netted and pre-netted and sliced, diced and circumcised. And the systems lose track of who owns what. And this came, so I was making some very public criticism of this, 05, 06, 07, I was dismissed as a nut. When 08 happened, first thing the SEC did went and plugged several of the loopholes that I was talking about, but there's much more there. For example, the mortgage-backed security crisis, the American Banking Association estimated in 2009 that of the mortgage-backed securities, which is when somebody takes, like Goldman Sachs, would take a 1,000 mortgages, package them into a bond, and sell that, that they were, well, in general, the American Banking Association said 18 to 30% of the mortgages that were stuffing the mortgage-backed securities didn't exist. What was happening was people were... Uh, somebody was getting rich, Lehman Brothers or Morgan or somebody was getting ready to issue a bond. They had expected to have the thousand. Only the paperwork had been done on 750 of them. They would just go ahead and issue the mortgage-backed security anyway and stuff, replace the missing 250 with some basically IOUs with the intent of replacing them later. 
But everything got so far behind in the whole mortgage-backed security industry before the crisis that when everything chernobyl the ABA said that 18 to 30 percent of this stuff was just kind of phantom. It didn't really. That's how much slop there was in that system of chain, uh, that uh, of chains of title. People didn't know who owned what. Now I think this has all gotten. Secretary Geithner famously privately made this awful comment about we need to foam the runway for the big banks. In other words, that's what the U.S. Treasury's done. They foamed the runway. They, they made it up. They made it so the banks could fill in all these potholes, of course, at the expense of the taxpayer. Uh, but the examples, you may have heard of the MF Global uh, scandal, a large company that melted down, $2 billion was missing. Those $2 billion of securities had been hypothecated and rehypothecated to London for some tax arbitrage. And then when it melted down, no one could tell who owned what. That is going on. And that's the essence of why I got 10 years ago so super fly TNT about Wall Street. Because Wall Street was doing this openly, you didn't have to scratch too hard to find out where it was going on and how much it was going on. And they were saying, well, it's okay. It's okay because of efficient market hypothesis and stuff. Everything comes out in the wash. It's not okay. They're wrong. They turned out to be wrong. Uh, so <clears throat> that brings me to the answer. Uh, to the, to the problem. The problem is if crypto is the answer, what's the question? And I'll close on this. Uh, what system respects the consent of its participants while undermining the centralized institutions we've come to distrust? To me, it's the technology that's being built here by people like you, which I see as the fruition of this 500-year-old effort that started right here in Amsterdam. So thank you for your attendance. Hope you have a good conference. I'd love to take questions. Thank you.